YouTube, so I am back with Matt. This is his debut on my channel. Hi, uh, I'm Matt. And so we are going to be talking about some cultural differences between New York and London, specifically, kind of broadly, US and UK. Um, but I feel like we're narrowing it down to kind of our two cities. So I think we're going to start off with food, because one of the big differences I've always seen people talk about is feeling that like there's a big difference in portion size. And Matt feels like there is. Yeah, I feel like in the US, the particularly in restaurants, like you get more food for your money and you get a bigger portion size, you get more fries, you get more, like if you're on chicken, you get more chicken. And particularly in drink sizes, I feel like you get much bigger drink sizes in it, like a US fast food chain than you do in a UK fast food chain. I mean, so definitely just from your delight at 7-Eleven with yeah. the big gulp. I was never gonna drink a big gulp, but like the possibility exists, like you couldn't get that in uh, like a British McDonald's or something. On the screen is a large plastic cup with a green straw and big gulp written in red. Below the cup is 7-Eleven's green, red, and orange logo. For anyone who may not know, the Big Gulp refers to the larger cup sizes for 7-Eleven's drinks. Originally, it referred to a 32 ounce or 940 milliliter cup, which in 1974 was the largest drink you could buy from a retailer. Now, it can range up to a gallon or 3.79 liters. But do you feel like there's any difference between like fast food portion sizes or do you feel like it's just across the board restaurant food sizes? I think it's more in fast food and like quick dining. I think if I think about like the sit down meals we had in New York or elsewhere in the US, there the portion sizes are more similar to what you get in the UK, I think. Okay, I agree. And that's what I was kind of wondering when you said you felt like it was bigger. I was like, wait, really? But yeah, I do think that, that that is true, like for the fast food, even again, just thinking about the drink sizes. Yeah. I remember when I went to Starbucks here, I think they had asked what sizes I wanted and I was like, I'm not sure of the difference. And luckily the um, barista was North American. I'm not sure if she was American or Canadian, but she was like, you know, this is this. She's like the tall is child size. It's, it's a baby <laughs> size. And I was like, okay, great. So <laughs> I'm gonna stick with the grande. On the screen are two clear plastic cups. The one on the left is taller and slightly wider. Both cups have Starbucks' twin-tailed mermaid logo. So something I realized while editing is that while I did say that I wasn't sure if there was a difference in cup sizes between countries, the barista may have just been explaining to me how small the other sizes were in comparison to the grande rather than making a country comparison. With that said though, there are differences in Starbucks's larger cup sizes. Anyone noticing a trend here? In the US, the largest size you can get, a Trenta, is 30 ounces, 883 milliliters, while in the UK, they only go up to Venti, which is 20 ounces, or 591 milliliters. Even the US's equivalent Venti option is 24 ounces, or 709 milliliters. I feel like that's a good segue, though, into another one of the stereotypes, which is sugar. Do you feel like we are sugarier, more sugary? So, definitely on some things, right? So like in the UK and in London, well, I mean, UK generally, not just London, you don't have drinks that have like pure cane sugar in them. I know you don't in the US anymore, you start with high fructose corn syrup or whatever that crap is. Um, <laughs> it's but corn, it's corn sugar. It feels like the drinks you get in the US are definitely much sweeter. Think about the Mountain Dew I drank when I landed in New York and was desperate for an edgy drink. And I felt like it was pouring like treacle down my mouth because it was so <laughs> sugary. Think about like the the big gulp or when I've asked for a Coke or had like an actual like non-diet Coke in the US one time and I was disgusted because it was so sweet. Definitely feels like there's more sugar in US drinks. The food, I don't know. Like sugar makes food tastier and there are definitely some things in the US that are tastier than they are in the UK, but I don't really know if that's sugar. So I think one of the things in terms of like the food, people talk about our bread, they'd be like, oh, the bread is so sugary. Mm. But I think that it also depends on the type of bread you buy. Like there are specifically ones that are sweet, like preserved with, with sweeteners and stuff, but that's not necessarily the bread that everyone buys. But on the flip side, I remember when I went to stay with my aunt in the US and she told me that the bread would just last like three weeks because there was so much sugar in the, fr in, three weeks in the fridge because there was so much sugar in it. I was like, is that bread? Is that, <laughs> is that really bread anymore? That doesn't sound like bread. 
See though, I wonder if it was about the type though, because I feel like I've had bread that's lasted a while. I've also had bread that's just gone bad at right, you know? Like, no, it doesn't, it doesn't last three weeks in the UK though. No, and I, I don't know if it's lasted three weeks for me either. Uh, to she, be she might have been buying very cheap, very stable bread. Maybe, and I think that's what it is though, right? Like it's the cheap, it's the stable stuff. Yeah. I think though another one that people talk about is like healthier food or like cleaner living in the UK and I think from did you laugh? Yeah, I did laugh. Okay. Uh, because it's obviously not true, right? Like the UK also has loads of sugar and we have so many sugary drinks, we have and so we have like desserts. a sweet tooth yeah, a sweet tooth culture that doesn't really exist in the same way in the US, I think. Obviously you get biscuits, uh, cookies <laughs> um, in both countries. But I feel like the UK has a a much bigger range i feel like if you go into a like uk corner shop the amount of space dedicated towards sweets and biscuits is actually quite a lot higher than it is in the us think about the one we went to in new york where we were getting uh, breakfast one time and it was like it was a decent enough size section of sweets it was maybe one one column of a shelf so one column of shelving and then i think about in the local shop just opposite the road from where we are london where there's an entire like aisle dedicated basically to sweet foods and snacks. <laughs> I will say that the difference there too might be like because we went to a corner store as opposed to a supermarket, but I do still think that, that the sweet culture is different. I think that like, don't get me wrong, like we will also have sugar and other things. And while my experience isn't that the bread is necessarily sweeter for a lot of things, um, I do think that there are bread that is sweetened with, with you know, that like to help to make it sh shelf stable. Is, is with uh, sugar or when my sister and I were doing the paleo diet, we had to find, we had to get meat from a butcher's because it wasn't also like sugar also wasn't added to it. And I was just like, okay. wait, you added sugar to some some of the bacon? Okay, and now again, I feel I like the UK not... probably does have less sugar in its Okay, well, I was gonna say, but I don't know if that's everything, but I do know they were like, that is a thing that does happen. Like it's not only, um, uh, like cured or or salt yeah yeah with salt like sometimes it's sugar. oh i guess yeah bacon is cured with salt and sugar but still still <laughs> i really don't think i expect sugar in my bacon one of my friends recently asked if i feel like the food is healthier if i feel like i think one thing for me is i don't think about whether something is organic or not or i feel like that that just doesn't seem like it's a thing here like it's usually just like fresh produce and i think one thing is true is that people tend to grocery shop more frequently here because it's it's fresher things are going bad faster but i think it's also about what you're buying as well but as i pointed out to my friend i gained a lot of pounds last year there are ingredients that aren't in food that are banned here but i think some of the things that we think like i remember i thought red food dye red red food coloring number 40 is it was banned here but it's just called something different and you have to have a warning label like letting people know that it's in the food but it's it is still there and so yeah i think I think that it's not as sort of cut and dry as like one place is healthy, one place is unhealthy. I mean, for sure. I do think that in general, you probably get more easy, easily available fresh fruits in veg in the UK. Yeah. And yeah. I think like definitely like in cities and stuff, but it's definitely not the case that our food is like objectively healthier. I think sticking to the topic of food and restaurants, another difference I noticed is that you don't open tabs in pubs. Um, it's just, you, you buy the round and then you just keep buying more rounds as opposed to, I actually had a bartender in, in New York get upset because my friends and I, we were each paying for each other. So one of us like paid for a round of drinks, the other one paid for a round, very, very British style actually, <laughs> before I even came here. And they were like, you know, the guy, he was actually Irish and he's like, I don't like running multiple cards. Are we just going to open a tab ladies? I mean, I remember the first time I had a drink in the US actually, which was last well, year. 17 in New York at a bar underneath the hotel I was staying in. Mm -hmm. I was like, I'll just go down, I'll have a beer or a gin or a cider probably, and or maybe a GNT, sit, read my book for a bit, chill, have a smoke, go back to my room, just like relax. Mm -hmm. And they brought me a menu and they put up a tab, and I was like, what? I got my card when the first drink arrived, and they were like, no, 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 no. And I was like, what? <laughs> What do you mean I don't pay when I get the drink? This is a bar, right? I mean, I obviously didn't say that. Yeah, I had already worked out that probably this was like opening up a tab, but that was really odd to me. And you obviously can. You can open a tab in a British pub. Yeah, it's just not the norm. No, I mean, if you're sitting down in a pub to eat, you might open a tab. Yeah. Um, but if you are just getting drinks, absolutely you're not opening a tab. And 
if you ask most pubs, they'd be like, no, obviously not. We don't trust you to not run off without paying. <laughs> Well, so usually they take your card and just have it. Oh, file, okay. Though. Yeah. So when you open a tab in the UK, they often won't do that. They'll just put it on a tab. Oh. Um, and then you'll pay like you would in a restaurant at the end of the meal. Got it. So if you had like, think about a pub meal, you might have had uh, a lunch. You might have, so you might have had burger and chips. You might have had four or five, six points, but they'll still just put it on the same receipt. Huh. I think next up, a good one to segue into next is tip culture, which doesn't really exist here. Uh, it, oh, true. so it seems like it's it's it becoming a bit more prevalent. It's always existed a bit in restaurants, and most places will ask for a tip in a restaurant, I think. Or, or they'll just add a service charge, which I don't like. No, I don't like that. I think rather than, than tip culture not existing, I think the, the the sort of insistence, like a tip is is expected in the, like, it's, it's just a part of the dining out experience, I think, at that point. Like, I've had people argue with me and argue with my friends about whether or not we tip, but we didn't want to tip because they didn't, it wasn't good service, yeah. which is what a tip should be. That, that is definitely a difference, I think. I think that in the UK, you don't, you, you're like, a, a, probably a small tip at this point is probably expected. Yeah, like a baseline tip is fine, but then it's not a minimum of, I think at this point people are saying like a minimum of 20%. Yeah, absolutely not. You, you tip maybe a small amount and then if you actually think or you pay the service charge and then if the service is actually good you might you tip. might go higher you might tip on top of that but it's definitely not expected and I, i've often wondered when we've been in the us because it always extends a bit beyond restaurants there's also things like uber drivers yeah drivers, things like that. i often wonder if i'm when i'm in the us i don't tip tax drivers i don't tip tax drivers in the uk i know mm -hmm. some people do uh, my dad's a great believer in it but i never have um i might leave tell them to keep the change if it's like a couple of plays like 50 60p um, I was thinking 99, and you're just like, yeah, I can keep that extra I mean, penny. I would also just say that because it's too much of a fat, <laughs> and they probably wouldn't have a penny on them. Um, but I don't tip as a general rule. Um, I don't just have drivers as a general rule. I don't have Uber drivers as a general rule unless they do a really good job. Um, I did one of them in the US. If the fact that I wasn't tipping Uber drivers probably caused my Uber, dri Uber rating to plummet a bit. So what's so interesting, like, on, on the that note is... The last time I was home, when I was ordering Uber Eats, they did not give me the option to not tip. There was no maybe later, which I get that? here. Mm. Um, I could lower it, but they were like, no, you are tipping. <laughs> and I think, I think tip culture in the US is just more forceful. And I think you end up with a lot of like, value judgments then too on, on people who don't tip. And people are like, well, why are you going out to a restaurant if you're not tipping? And you know, and it's like, well, it's i think there's more to it than that like it's not just about tipping just a tip but also tipping because of good service tipping maybe a baseline tip because you have been doing a lot for me um but not automatically 20 to 25 like like i feel like the number has just increased and just keeps increasing like soon it's just gonna be like yeah just give a hundred percent tip just double the bill no what i mean that is also a bit like the sales tax thing right like, uh, yes, something actually, that that's confuses a really good me one. a lot um, as a British person whenever in America is like why is the prices on the menu more on the counter or what I've been quoted not what I'm paying and they're like oh yeah 20% sales tax I'm like well why not just tell me why not <laughs> just tell me how much the thing costs because... no that's something I really appreciate about being here actually is is that the price of what I'm paying for is the price because again going back to the uber order example like my meal is twenty dollars and i'm like okay cool 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 i can do this think delivery fee service fee whatever i might come up to 25 and then somehow it's like 30 35 because there's like ten dollars of tax and, and service charges and and just hope and i'm just like whoa 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 what is you know what is happening here we'd always joke about this like a dollar a bag of chips could never be a dollar because it's always going to be at least a dollar or eight or something you know like there's always something extra and yeah. i remember actually when we that, that how much i take that price because when we went for you know, a couple of days ago um and the place gave it the the tax total on the receipt and i was like huh I was yeah, like, yeah, yeah yeah okay obviously that's vat it's a 20 percent. it's not it's the same tax it always is but because they put it as tax i was like what and I was going through the menu and checking it, it hadn't actually been... He was so ready to fight and, and be like, this is not our bill. <laughs> what is happening here? This is the price that I saw. We are in England, not America. You didn't say that, but I feel like I heard uh, it. It was implied. It was implied. <laughs> but as, as it's happened, it wasn't necessary, but still. Yeah, it was just them actually writing out the breakdown. And that yeah, was don't weird. like it. 
give me just give me a standard <laughs> that is this number not breakdown per item please sticking on the discussion of restaurants is also how early things close in london versus new york even chicago things have been like open later yeah i remember when we went to that restaurant in chicago and it was like 10 half 10 um because just after we went to the bookshop to close at 10 i think yeah and um and it was it must have been 20 past 10 it was just bustling and they were yeah. like yeah, if you want to sit down to eat, you, you know, you're gonna wait like an hour. And I was like, oh, we were just getting takeaway, which is good. But, yeah, 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 and they were they were fine with that, but it was like, you know, they were clearly closing. Like last call was at least around midnight. Whereas when I joined the choir, we went to a pub afterward, and it was 9 p.m. and the pub didn't close till 11, but last call it was like 8:45 for food. Yeah. Yeah, for food. And that was insane. And then there was there was nothing else really open. Maybe McDonald's is like a late night thing. And I think occasionally maybe you'll find something that's open until 11. Yeah, so I think you'll find a reasonable number of like, particularly in like central cities, um, stuff that's open till 11 for food. But it's normally fast food chains yeah. or things of that nature. I can't. That's so wild to me. Because New York, like, I mean, it's a city that never sleeps, right? Yeah, well, London also doesn't really sleep, right? Sort of Why are you staying awake without being sustained by well, real because food? Because most people are asleep after eleven o'clock. I, I say this like I'm trying to defend London. I actually really <laughs> dislike it. I, I really wish it was it was much easier to get a good restaurant meal at ten o'clock at night. Um, because quite often, like particularly, just like, think about after a show. Or yeah, something. after a show, or you get back from work at let's say half six, seven. You go do your shop, or you go clothes uh, shopping. They use shop for grocery shopping. Oh, yeah. Right, you go do your shop for groceries, you come back, it's like nine o'clock, you're like, maybe I don't want to cook, maybe I'll order something. And nine o'clock, all right, most places still, let's say you finish work, let's say you finish work at eight, and you still want to do your shop because you need your groceries for the week, or you're meeting a friend for drinks very reasonably, but you're going somewhere that doesn't have food, and then it's like 10 o'clock, you finish up a couple of pints with a mate, you're wandering home, maybe through a, like, a housing development like the Olympic Village in Stratford, and you're like, maybe I'd love a bite to eat. And you're like, oh, we're going to Westfield, which is a big shopping centre. And your choices are, you can have a McDonald's, we can have a Popeyes, or KFC, or Burger King. There's nothing else. There's no actual restaurants. I think the interesting thing there is that not only are those all fast food chains, they're, everything you just named is an American fast food chain. Yes. I mean, I think about when we watched the film, when we watched the film in Stratford. Um, Our second date? Yeah, second date. Um, I think we had Shake Shack that night. That we ended up having Shake Shack. Well, there were a couple of things open, but like the I was and like, I think let's they go. They're closing. But a lot of them were closing. And we we're like, let's go for pizza. It was a Franco Manca, decent British pizza chain. Really like them. And they were like, nope, we're closed. And I was like, okay, maybe we're like, this chicken place closed. Uh, Chopstick closed, and they ended up Shake Shack because it was still it was open until I think like midnight. But other than places like Shake Shack, they're just not open that late. I'm glad you mentioned our second date because we can also talk about a difference, some differences between dating culture. What, you mean how I shocked you by not having a formal conversation before saying that you were my girlfriend? Yeah, you just informed me and I was like, oh. I mean, okay, that, that might not doing. be a British American thing. That might also be an autistic thing. <laughs> I think some of it is a little bit British. I think I've seen a number of like people posting on Reddit and I have also just seen like articles and stuff where people have said, you know, like there it's it's like I'm a European man, whether it's Polish, British, and I'm in America and I'm so confused. I mean, honestly, the idea of this like talking phase in relationships that lasts okay, no. not not talking, sorry, the like No, I think the talking phase is is dumb. I think the talking phase is the get to know you before dating. I think what happens is that people are like they don't want to start dating until they've gotten to know you really well, but that's kind of the point of dating. Yeah, and I think I think American dating seems like it has a lot more prolonged period. It also seems like it has weirdly a lot more formal rules for a country that prides itself on having freedom. <laughs> um, yes, but we're also prudes. Remember who were the ones prudes. who came to you the US, right? Like prudes. it was the Puritans. Definitely feels like there's more structure and definition in, in I think US so. Because it's like, you know, I do think that there is a general sense of like buy a third date, buy whatever, like you should talk. But there are people who will have talking stages for for six months or something. And it's like someone will say like months later, like, oh well we never talked about it. We never made it official. You know, so like I could still see this person. And I think we are splitting hair is there right but like it is very much more a thing so i do think that online apps um dating apps and, and like online dating is changing the culture a bit from what some people have said particularly also i think just in the anglosphere so in 
UK, in you know Australia, wherever. And I think they are like, because you're meeting people on apps, there is still like, we should talk about it or like, you know, it, there's more room for there to be confusion because you might be talking to more than one person, yada, yada, yada. Um, whereas I feel like they were like prior to, you just meet people through friends and then you date and you guys would just keep dating or, or not date and, and that was it. And I think that that's less so what we do. I feel like honestly though, even if you meet someone through a friend, that's not what's going to happen. Like it still could be like, you know, what does he think? Is he, you know, are we dating? Is he seeing other people, you know? Like, because you just don't know at this point. And I think that's where it comes from. It's just like, one, just the high prevalence of people being unfaithful, which is wild, but also like dating, dating culture. And while you're dating someone, like that first, second date, you might still be talking to other people and maybe you find someone else more interesting. And you know, like, are you keeping this person on the back burner? I mean, like that sort of thing definitely happens. In like you might go on a date with different number of people, you might have people you like go on just a second date with two people within a week of each other. You might be like one of my housemates and go on like four or five first dates in one week. But I don't think what happens as much is I don't think you have like the sort of prolonged and I also think that like there's less of a, a point where people are like, let's have a conversation about what the, what we are. Obviously that happens, right? The, yeah. The, the people, no one's like, no one should, well, I hope people aren't foolish enough just like, keep going on without ever talking about things but I do think that in the UK at least it's more common for things to sort of fall into next fall stages into of relationship yeah, yeah. and they fall into place almost and I also think that you definitely wouldn't be in a place like after three four dates in the UK where you're still talking to someone if you didn't feel like there was a romantic connection yeah and I think that should be the case I do think it's okay to kind of date for a, a few a few dates to see if you how you feel about the person but I think after a point it's like okay like we're on the sixth date if you didn't feel it before you probably we won't feel it, it now, now. No. <laughs> I think um the other thing too another dating difference um is is what people do I've seen a lot of people who say that just pubs are the thing and they kind of yeah. like that Americans do more and I think that also comes to our difference in drinking culture a bit as well. I definitely think that people going for a drink in a pub is a British first day classic. I mean I feel like that's our coffee date or ice cream date. Yeah maybe. Um, you just replace it with alcohol because the British really like alcohol. Um, We're like, you know, the, you guys are just all like conservative and stuck up. You gotta get your you gotta get your courage somewhere, right? Yeah, except for the fact that, as I think you alluded to when you made a joke about Americans being prude, actually I think British people are much less prude than Americans. Um, it's actually, yes. Um, like 100%, I actually think we're much less prude. Um, I think people are far more willing to talk about this sort of like, their personal lives, their sexual lives, with their friends. Uh, I shouldn't carry it only really with their friends. Yeah. Um, than my understanding as Americans do. And I think that sometimes surprises people because people get the impression British stuck up conservatives. But actually, if you get, uh, if you were with a bunch of British friends at a pub, or if you're just like getting a, deep, uh, getting a meal and a bottle of wine or getting some food in Camden Market, you'll hear people talking about their personal lives. Yeah, um, I think in, on like our third date, yeah, we've heard some the, yeah, wild, wild stories. Stuff. <laughs> um, but like people will be very open and quite crude about their personal lives. In a way that I don't think, from what I was thinking of you and your friends in America, is as true that. I mean, some of my friends are yeah, right, wild childs and yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I, I think it does fluctuate, right? But I do think that that's an interesting cultural stereotype that's not necessarily true. I think though, I think that people feel like there's a more openness, I think in terms of American culture, in terms of, you know, just thinking about what we find as politeness, like talking to people and talking, and obviously that, that also varies, right? Because we're coming from two big cities, so people are also very much like, I'm happy to help you, I'm happy to talk to you, but also I've got my own life, like we're not in a small town or even just a slower town and, and or a slower city rather. But I think that, hang on, where am I going with this? Um... Something about fruits. Um, oh yeah, I think Americans give sort of the appearance, I guess, of being more open because it's just sort of friendliness culture, which isn't to say that Brits aren't friendly, but I think some of it is is stereotyping a bit. And I think like with New Yorkers and with Londoners, like people will talk to you, but you won't be diving into deep conversations immediately. But I think like the culture, I, I feel like weirdly enough, actually like having a monarchy, having like, you know, just all this stuff like lends people more toward feeling like there's more or deeper tradition 
Which I think there is, but not in the way that people think, if that makes sense. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's fine. I think it's the idea that because Britain's a very old country, that we've got lots of traditions, that we seem quite like the way that people portray it and think about life. When they come to London in Friends, they go to their bus to have a terrible beer, um, go to like quaint things. And like, actually, like, New York and London, really, at the end of the day, you're kind of splitting hairs in the difference between them. Yeah, no, they're, them. they're quite similar. Like, we've, talk, we've been talking about the differences for like 20 minutes, but they're marginal things, and a lot of them are actually like bigger US-UK cultural things. Yeah, but I think overall, like, I think New York is louder and more bustling, but both are still very big cities. Both still have, like, such insane cultural diversity. I do think, again, like, thinking about the differences, though, when thinking about dating uh, and thinking about late-night restaurants, I guess you guys also don't have late night things because your trains no, stop, stop at like 1am. They a. do stop at 1am. They do all stop at about 1am except uh, on Friday Fridays and Saturdays. And, Saturdays. and there's only five lines though. Whereas yeah. in New York, like, okay, so I will say this. Uh, we are 24 hours. Um, service be starts coming slower and I know that you feel like service is slow no matter what. Because yeah, we'll, it is. <laughs> we'll come back to that. But um, service is slower and you might have like the five train isn't running but the two is running in its place or you know things like that. Like you'll have less lines but overall it's it's still more than London's I think. I mean we have a decent night bus network. And there are there is one national rail line that runs twenty four hours. Is there really? Yeah, the one that goes from London to Brighton has a train every hour. Oh wow, I didn't know that. Yeah, um, so there's one in the north of England as well that's in the same boat, but huh. that's just not relevant here. Um, now, what I will say is, I do think in other cities in the U.S., like the transportation does has a cut off, does have a cut off, except maybe for buses and stuff like that. But I think Chicago had overnight trains as well. Did they really? I, I yeah, I think Chicago is on the twenty four hours, as is Copenhagen and New York. That's it. Yeah, that's it. That's wild. Paris? No. Tokyo? No. That's wild to me. Okay. Wow. I just don't think so. I might be wrong. But I remember reading Copenhagen, Chicago, and New York all had 24 hour subway systems. Huh. Uh, 24 7 as well. I think there might be other places that like London have it on weekends or certain days. Yeah, yeah. Um, That's so fascinating. Yeah, you're like, I'll start trying to stop at 1 a.m. I would say, probably, if you're out after 1 a.m. and you're partying hard or you're like a night worker, 1 a.m. is the sleepy time. You should be in bed by 1 a.m. I mean, so. Like, yeah, I'm laying down by 1 a.m., but still, that's not the point. You know, in my heyday, <laughs> the three times that I went out in undergrad. Yeah, and like, if I go out late at night, and I haven't been out late at night, but on a Thursday or something, when there isn't a night tube, I get an Uber, which sucks because it's expensive. Or if I'm on... But if you're like across and... Or if I'm on my own, I'm to be honest, I'd probably just take a night bus. They're not you that bad. You cycled super late though too, right? Oh, I have cycled super late. I've cycled at like 3, 4 a.m. once or twice. Wow. But I guess you can out cycle in a crease, so. Yeah, I mean, this was like late. Most of the time we're thinking about late, so I'm cycling back from like uh, my friends in Stratford at like 11 o'clock at night and I'll be back at 12. It's really yeah, not so late. not like late. It's not late, late. late. Yeah. Um, and I could make that journey by tube, I just choose to cycle it. <laughs> On that note, thinking about like which cities are the only, like the only few, the, what? Thinking about which cities have 24 7 transportation and them not being a lot I'm, i will fact check to double check on the screen is a new york city subway train it's silver with a black front and a red m on the front of the train there is an american flag and the mta logo in the background there are brick buildings along with some graffiti new york style so as promised i fact checked and matt was almost correct the cities that provide 24-hour train services are new york Chicago, Copenhagen, and, though they only run one line, Philadelphia. Additional fun fact, because I couldn't decide if trams counted, the cities that have 24-hour tram services are Calcutta, Prague, Melbourne, Cologne, whose proper pronunciation I could not get right for this video, Berlin, Krakow, and Budapest. Though, like Philly, they only run one tram line. I know you feel like we have very different attitudes toward public transportation yeah. in London versus New York. I don't think very different from maybe it's stretch. It's definitely different. different. It's definitely different. So I think both cities, people are like, you can use the, the subway slash tube and it's the sort of default for getting around central London or Manhattan in New York case. Yeah. Where I think it feels, where it feels different is like, a, it's actually more of a country-wide thing. But things like, um, 
I mean, think about your friend, he lives in Orson Age, like, on whatever the hell, no, Metro North? Yeah, the Metro North. Um, and I think about that compared to like the Elizabeth Line in London, or even like the National Rail services in London. I think people, if you were going from, or like even going to Jersey, right, like when your friend, when your friend came over uh, to New York, Manhattan, she drove from Jersey, and I was like, I cannot imagine... Driving instead of taking the I train. I cannot imagine in London, someone who lives near a train station, or even, to be honest, lives within a 5, 20, five to 15 minute drive of a train station. Yeah, not choosing, just driving to the train. Yeah, choosing but to New come New Yorkers across. feel that way too sometimes, right? Like the ones who don't drive. Yeah. They're like, what are you doing driving in Manhattan? Yeah, I mean, sure, but I, I definitely see more cars in Manhattan than I did in central London by yeah. a huge margin. Um, like, it definitely feels like more people drive in New York than they do in London. And I think people drive as a way to get into New York more than they Yes, I drive think that's also very true. I think that's also very true. Um, I had co-workers who would drive to work, like, put their, like, their car in a, oh, wow, uh, not a car park, garage. <laughs> yeah, so, some of the Anglicisms, Anglicisms. Slipping through, slipping through. Yes. Britishisms? Britishisms. Anyway, garage. They parked their car in a garage and then, you know, then like if they had to do any traveling for work, they take the train, they do all of that. But yeah, they would drive to get into the city. Which is absolutely wild to me. Like, the, the, I mean, some of this I think might genuinely be because the, London has a congestion charge. But I was going to say that London's more congested. It's definitely not. Manhattan is as congested as central London. Um, I think it might be. It's a smaller space. Though. It is a smaller space. I think it's more um, packed in, it is so more I think you in. feel it a lot more as well. Uh, and definitely outside central London people will drive. Yeah. Um, like, but even then, quite often, I was going to the football as a kid, for example, which is not central London, like zone two, three, which is uh, for American listeners or viewers, I guess, somewhere in Brooklyn <laughs> or very <laughs> upper Manhattan. Yeah, it's like further out, but not... Super far. I mean, the actual comparison based on like the geographic location would be somewhere in Jersey City, but I realised that, that that doesn't really work. Um, but like when I was going to see the football from my dad, from where I lived in south of London, we often would just go into London and we would take the train. You could make that journey by car, but it was long and it was a bit of an arse. And if you ran into trouble on the motorway, traffic on the motorway, you would you might not make the game. Whereas if you took the train, it would be 40 minutes from the station near in our hometown to London, and then 45 minutes from central London, probably a bit less, about maybe half an hour from central London to the football. And you would always do that. Like, just get the vibe that for, like, people who come into New York don't take public transport in the same way they do people who come into London. Yeah, I think that's true. I think that's true. Um, I think people, you know, also like the stereotypes about our trains being so much dirtier. They kind of are. I mean, no, they are. They like one hundred percent. No, they are. <laughs> like, like your trains won't run twenty four seven, but ours are cleaner and they are more regular. Um, and I do. Some people do feel like that the trains should not be twenty four seven, so that we have that time to to clean. Yeah. And I think that there is something to be said for that, but I think that would also be a big kind of cultural shift to not have the I wonder going. though if you could like I mean do they all do you need to have service on all the lines and, 20, all the time. and on, that's like, the thing you don't even have it on Tuesday at two in the morning right yeah and that's the thing though you don't even have it on all the lines so actually I don't know right because I feel like like a, a chunk will be taken out of commission or only running for a certain amount of time between certain stops and so you can have that time to clean um, I do know that pe I've seen, I've read rather, that when there was a concerted effort to fix up the trains and to fix up the city in like the 90s and stuff, so, like they're, like those things stuck, but I think, I think there's been a lot of decline for a number of reasons. And I think that you can, you can see that, right? Um, I know some people, it's so interesting to me to, like, I, I love New York, I do, but it's also kind of dirty, but it's also somehow glamorous at the same time. And so it's such an interesting juxtaposition for me. I don't think a lot of London has the, like, feeling, can have the feeling growing, you think, particularly given the complete lack of bins compared to New York. Yeah, but, so that's the thing, we have so many more garbage cans, but there's still, like, litter and stuff, and it's actually impressive that it's, it's, now don't get me wrong, right, like, 
uh, Nettie and I, when when I first moved here, she saw like a half a chicken carcass on the floor one day, and then we also saw like an apple core like just sitting on the seat next to us. Like we've seen like like there have been random bits of litter, but it's also I mean the the chicken carcass was weird, but like it's it, it might have been. Uh, they have foxes here. They're like they're raccoons, and it's wild to me. They're much cuter than raccoons. Yeah, I wonder if they're soft. But anyway, they are apparently. Oh, I thought you were going to say definitely. I thought you might have pet one. No, I'm not. I don't want to pet the murder dog, but... <laughs> but yeah, no. Um, And so I think, like, there are, like, random random things, random bits. Like, I... A, like, a can or something was following me with the wind. Do you remember yesterday? Yeah, I do. Um, that. So that there, happens a reasonable amount. Right? So there's still things. But our infrastructure is cleaner. Yeah, that's that's what I was and just I getting at. And I think I'm thinking about it. Just compare stay on some trains, Thames and trains, which are not... Um, subway equivalent, they're like LIR or something. Commuter trains. Commuter trains. Uh, people are moaning about them not being as clean as ever. And that's like an actual like Twitter for raw. Because I think people would be like, yeah, it's graffiti on a subway train. What do you mean? <laughs> yeah, right? Like, that's that's our culture. Our culture is graffiti. And I think, like, one of the final things, too, is, again, sticking out to the trains. You've already said that you feel like the trains are less um, frequent. I which mean, they, they, definitely, they are. definitely are. Like, they come every minute or so, and it's... No, it's not quite impressive. every minute, but it's like so. It's, like every it's every most most you find it's every two to three, maybe four. Well, listen, for minutes. like a five minute plus wait time, it feels like every minute, okay? Yeah. And um, when it gets to like, because whenever it gets to more than five minutes, everyone's like, "What do you mean it's five minutes? Yeah, time for a train?" I remember I expect someone. One... <laughs> I remember someone being like, seven minutes. This is inhumane," and I'm like, seven minutes. That's that's a normal wait. That's fine. I mean, there are exceptions. So some of the trains come less frequently. The Elizabeth Line's like every seven minutes, the Circle Line's every ten. But those are the outliers. Yeah. I remember like when we were staying at Nettie's, um, getting to the subway station, seeing a sign for 12 minute wait, and I was like, what? <laughs> You're like, what? where am I? Why is there a 12 minute wait for a tube train? <laughs> I know. Um, do oh. you think there's any other. Oh, go on. Go on, no, go on. Go ahead. I forgot what's going to rumble about now. <laughs> we spend a lot of time talking about differences, but any similarities that you want to highlight or anything you love about New York as a Londoner? Or... Well, I think you go into like some of the similarities, right? Which is that the, they're both big cities and they both, they feel similar. I, I quibble about the subway versus the tube. I prefer the tube and I prefer the subway. London streets are smaller. London streets are smaller. So it feels more compact. Uh, I mean, even it is, though it's it, bigger, it, the, but the core is more compact. Yeah. Uh, like Manhattan is a bigger space than Central London is. Yeah. Um, London does feel a bit more compact. Its tourist areas, I think, sometimes feel a bit easier to get to. Um, but the definition, like, absolutely insane when they're in Queens. Can't, getting between Queens and Brooklyn is really hard. Getting between bits of South London is really hard. Um, they have the same sort of problems in many ways. They're big, both big global cities that attract bright young things who can't afford to have houses because they've been bought up by the generation or two above them and are competing with pressure from left, right and centre. Always really popular for, for post-grads looking yeah, for jobs. They're all really popular for post-grads looking for jobs. Um, but also you've got people who need to do that I manual work and can't afford to rent a place of their own. Yeah. Um, that Those are problems that are true across both New York and London. Yeah. Um, but they're also both really great places to live. Um, okay. They have like I, I think that's being biased. Yes, that's what we're talking about. Being biased, I think they have the best musicals, best plays, best concerts, possibly best food. Oh, um, musicals is a good one. I think last thing I'll say uh, for me is I think I told you that Broadway shows. I've I've gone to Broadway productions where even if I didn't like the voice of the singer it's always it still sounds good it still sounds great like there might be like a nasality a bit of nasality that I don't like or something I feel like here um it feels like I've sometimes found like more people who's I'm like I guess technically they might be good but I don't love their voice so I feel like this thing could be I better it, I, I feel like West End feels more accessible though like it feels yeah. like yeah I mean also on a, on a very simple level I think it's a bit, it's a bit cheaper um, no, it definitely is. Like, that is not it's a bit. solidly it's cheaper. It's solidly cheaper. <laughs> um, and we haven't even talked to a person living and we're already at 40 minutes, so perhaps we should okay. probably not yes. do that. Yes, maybe a part two. Maybe a part two. But thank you for joining me. 
um, as I said, this was your YouTube debut. Maybe you'll be on more. Um... Actually, actually, it's not entirely true. I had forgotten that previously I, there is quite a few clips of my voice on YouTube as part of Team Screech Bavon commentating card games. You've been on someone else's channel? No, it was, it was our collective channel, dear. This is terrible. I'd completely forgotten um, about it until just now. This is your debut to my channel, then. And my debut in the flesh. <laughs> ah, yes, 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 in the flesh. <laughs> um, well, yeah, thanks for coming. You guys, let me know if there's anything else you want to see Matt in. Otherwise, you'll hear him in, in some of my accessibility reviews in the background as he films. And, yeah. Thanks very much for letting me do a YouTube channel. Of course. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Till next time. Bye.